Hi, I'm Egan Inoue. Racquetball is a very fun and exciting game and also very addicting. If you become more competitive, it can be very frustrating. In this video, I'm going to be sharing some of my secrets that has worked for me. Also some very important basics to some more advanced techniques, such as the forehand and backhand grip, the forehand and backhand stroke, some drills, some court positioning, footwork, shot selection, strategies, and last but not least, serves. If I don't have enough time in this video to cover the serves, you can catch it in the second video. But stay tuned and find out. Eye guards are very important. I like the idea of hingeless eye guards like these. Shoes to me are also very important. In racquetball, we have a lot of quick stops and goals, a lot of side to side and front and back movements. I like shoes that have gum rubber soles and round edges. The rounded edges are good because they are like radial tires. You have more grip on the edge of the shoe. Now, about picking the right racket for you. There are lots of rackets on the market now, but you need to pick the one that feels comfortable to you. When you first grab a racket, it should feel comfortable, and most times the most comfortable racket will be an E-Force racket. You should have a space between your fingertips and palm. You don't want the fingers touching your palm. Think about this. If your fingers touch your palms, that's as tight as you can grip. If you keep a space between there, you can always grab on tighter. There are three types of grips. Leather, synthetic, and rubber. I play with the rubber grip because it gives the racket a better feel and acts as a shock absorber. If you use a glove when you play, then the rubber grip is the way to go. There's basically two types of rackets out. One with a throat piece and one without. The racket with the throat piece make the sweet spot more round compared to the open throat models which make the sweet spot more egg shaped. You will probably find that the open throat will give you more power. That's because the main strings which are your power strings are longer. String tension is also something I want to bring up. The tighter the tension the harder you will hit. True or false? This is false. The tighter the string tension the less time the ball stays on your racket. This means you have less room for error and less time to let your strokes and racket work for you. You'll find more control and more power using less effort with looser strings. My rackets are strung at 24 pounds. Tighter strings also mean more chance of arm problems. There are also different gauges of string. I like the 18 gauge string. The higher the gauge number, the smaller the diameter of the string. What's the difference? Well, the thinner string is more responsive and lively. It breaks quicker than the thicker 16 gauge, but I personally think it's worth it to hit harder with less effort and get an extra couple of points. This is my secret I'm sharing with you. Take it or leave it. But if you decide to keep it, let's try to keep it our secret. And to get started, of course, you need a racquetball. Now, grab your rackets and let's start with the forehand grip. For a right-hander, the V of your hand should be on the right ridge of the racket. Lefties are opposite. The V should be on the left ridge. Everybody's V will not be in the same area of the ridge because no one's physical makeup is the same. What's important is that your racket be parallel to the front wall upon impact. That should be on the instep of your left foot. Lefties on your right foot. This is where we make the racket grip adjustment. If you hold the racket grip over too much and your racket faces down, you can expect more skips or balls that hit the floor before reaching the front wall. If your racket faces up too much, then you can expect more balls going up Make sense? After that adjustment, you should have your racket parallel to the front wall, or what I call a flat racket. Now you want to remember 
to keep the head of the racket up. If the head drops down, then your racket movement will be like so. If you're late, what happens? Yes, your ball will skip. If you're early, it'll go up. That's why we want to keep the head up. If you come around late, the ball will go right. If you come around early, the ball will go left. At least the ball will always make it to the front wall. Once you have that, all you have to do for the forehand is raise your arm just like you'd be calling someone. The important thing in this movement is that the elbow should be above your shoulder. That's where we get our arm momentum and power from. The next movement is the elbow which leads the stroke moving away from the body and toward the front wall. Then the racket comes around. The elbow movement is like a baseball pitcher in delivery. He has his elbow way in front of the ball. That's the same idea as a racquetball stroke. On the backhand, the same ideas are applied. Let's start with the grip. The right-hander's V will change to the left ridge of the grip. Like the forehand, the place where your V ends on may be different than the next person. Lefties, your V will be on the right ridge of the grip. On the backhand, you also want your racket to be flat or parallel to the front wall. Keep the head of the racket up so that your racket travels on a horizontal plane. From here, just bring your arm back and slightly up. You don't want your racket to be too high or you lose power because the racket will have to make a big vertical drop before coming around. And you don't want the racket too low, otherwise you won't be able to use all your muscle groups. You want it to be right in between. Now your racket comes forward just like this, slow and easy. Some of you are probably wondering, how do you hit the ball so hard? I hear that everywhere I go. To hit the ball hard, the only thing you need is an E-force racket. Something to remember on both the forehand and the backhand stroke is that to hit it harder, you don't need to grit your teeth and grunt. It all comes down to timing. If you can get your legs, hip, arm, chest, and shoulders working together and exploding on impact with the ball, that's when you hit the ball the hardest. Your racket speed is another working factor. The faster your racket comes around with the proper timing of the body, the harder you hit the ball. On the stance, you want to be in a crouched low position. If the ball is lower, bend with your legs, not with your back. You need to remember that your contact point is at the instep of your leading foot. When you drop the ball, make sure that you drop it toward the front wall to compensate for your step. If you drop it in front of your leading foot, then take a step, you will find that the ball is now in back of your contact point. So make sure that you compensate for that step. Here's a drill that you can use to get your stroke to become second nature and to help you find your optimum contact point with the ball. You want to start from center court and it's the same drill for the forehand and the backhand. You just drop the ball and hit it. The object is to keep the ball between yourself and the side wall 10 times in a row. If it hits the side wall or goes behind you, start again from zero. This will also help you in game situations. This drill will teach you to hit through the ball no matter what the score is. Now you all have perfect strokes, but in the game situation, you can't hit the ball like you did in practice. In your head you're thinking, Egan taught me wrong. What we have to do now is get your footwork better. Now that your strokes are good, your feet and legs have to get you there so you can use your stroke. Basically, from side to side, you only really need two steps. Remember when you're taking your first step to the forehand side, you should already have your racket ready. As you're taking your second step, you should be taking your swing. Same for the backhand. Your first step, racket ready. On your second step, start your swing. Anytime the ball gets by you and goes to the corner, now it's big steps to get in the area and small steps to prepare to hit the ball. You need the big steps 
to get there fast. And once you're there, the small steps make it easier to set up. This is especially so if the ball changes directions. If it jumps at you while you're in a big step, it's hard to move back. But with small steps, you can change at any time. It's important to keep the head level at the same height while moving to hit the ball. So remember, if your head moves, so does your vision. Court positioning. Do we want to control center court? Yes, because it's the closest position to the vital areas on the court. Where is center court? Well, it's an area around here. We don't want to pinpoint one spot. We want to move around in the area according to what's happening in the game. For example, if your opponent is hitting lots of pinches that you're not getting to, you need to move forward in center court. If you're getting past, it's time to move back into center court. If he's hitting lots of down the lines that are not coming off the back wall and you are not getting to, you should move a step to whichever side he's hitting from. Before I go into some strategies, let me show you some different offensive and defensive shots. Your offensive shots are called down the line, cross court, reverse pinch, pinch, and splat. The difference between the pinch and the splat is that the splat is normally hit when you're closer to the wall and pinches when you're farther from the wall. They both hit the side wall then the front wall. On the defensive side you can use ceilings, Z's, and around the wall shots. The defensive shots are usually used to move your opponent out of center court, especially if you don't have an offensive opportunity. The basic strategy in racquetball is to hit the ball away from your opponent. But that's not always the easiest thing to do. What you will find in most matches is that whoever is controlling center court is usually the winner of the match. If you don't have an offensive shot, then try to move your opponent out of center court with ceiling balls or around the wall shots. If your opponent is cutting off the around the wall shots, you should stick with basic ceiling balls. There are other situations that may come up in matches, like you're playing a drive serve and shoot player and you cannot match up to his or her style. What you need to do is change the pace, slow the game down with lobs, timeouts, and 10 seconds between rallies. It will usually work unless your opponent is concentrating well. Hey Egan, you got five more minutes. Maybe we can cover serves in five minutes. Nah, let's just get in the next video. Nah, just kidding. The serve can be your opponent's worst nightmare. Serving is the only time in the game that you can hold the ball and hit it anywhere you want. It is also the only time that you can score points. On the drive serve, we first have to take the proper two-step serve motion. These two steps are very important to hit a hard drive serve. The first step starts your momentum forward, thus giving you more power to serve with less effort. Next we need to work on serve motion deception. We need to disguise all of our serves using the same motion and being able to hit at least three different serves from the same movement. All of this takes patience, time, and lots of practice. After all of this, we want to be able to serve at least three different serves from three different positions in the service box. This changes the angle on the serves that your opponent is seeing. My objective as a server is to have my opponent worried and guessing what my next serve will be. You know and I know because we have all felt this way before when your opponent is serving good drives. It's stress. Lob serves are the same idea. The three main differences are that the ball is moving slower, 
you only need a one step motion and instead of only being able to mix up the angle horizontally you can now do it vertically I can now hit high lobs or three quarter lobs thus changing the angle vertically while changing the horizontal angle also well I did my part in showing you all the aspects of the game now it's your turn to see what you can integrate and adapt into your game see you on the court with an e-force racket